Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. My friends, I want to take a quick moment to give you a special invitation. If you enjoy the Live Inspired podcast, what would you say to joining me live once a month? And not just joining me, but hundreds of other like-minded Live Inspired community members. And what if you could do it from the comfort of your own home? My friends, Live Inspired in Studio with John O'Leary is exactly this, a gathering of our Live Inspired community members once a month for a live inspirational webcast. Let's do life together. Registration for in-studio only happens twice a year. And here's a secret, it's opening soon. Don't miss it. Sign up right now. Be one of the very first to know when Live Inspired in-studio registration opens. You can go right now, check it out. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. One more time, it's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. Well, hello, my friends. My name is John O'Leary. So happy to have you here joining me in the Live Inspired Movement. On every Live Inspired podcast, we have amazing guests join us to share their stories, their examples, their lessons, their life. But as you all know, it's not about them. It's about what they learned and how we can apply their lessons in our own walk. Well, today we have the great opportunity of having a new friend. His name is Tom Logan. He made the two-hour trip up from Southern Illinois to share a little bit about his story. And before we talk about his story, a few numbers for you. 663 million people around the world are without clean water every day. 50% of hospital beds in sub-Saharan Africa are full of patients suffering from water-related illness. People in sub-Saharan Africa, this one blows my mind, listen to it, spend 40 billion hours a year fetching water. And then final stats, and we could share stat after stat after stat. Final stat, though, for this moment is, according to UNICEF, 4,000 children die because of unsafe drinking water every day. Every day, 4,000 children die because of unclean drinking water. And when we hear stats like this, if you're at all like me and like so many others, you kind of throw up your hands and say, well, geez, that sounds bad. But what can one person do about that? How can we actually make a difference in something so insurmountably massive? How can we make a difference? Well, I am seated across today from a man who uh, may not feel worthy of it, but this is exactly what he's doing in his life today. He is digging wells. He is evangelizing on the front lines. He is making a profound difference. He's come to share his story in the Live Inspired podcast on what we can do in our own lives to make a profound difference in the lives of others, starting, by the way, with the reflection in the mirror. His name is Tom Logan. He's a guy that I look up to, a guy I respect, a guy that when you hear this story, you are going to want to learn more about as well. So friends, brothers and sisters at home, on your way to work, working out right now, wherever you may be finding yourself listening to the Live Inspired podcast, I ask you right now to open wide your hearts, Open wide your minds, open up your journals, grab that pen, start taking notes. You'll want to do it today for our newest friend, Tom Logan. Tom, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. John, thank you very much. It's a privilege, privilege for me to be here. Man, it is our privilege to be here with you today. And uh, we were connected through your friend, Kimberly. We'll be talking about her here in a moment. But before we bring her on, for those who don't yet know the name Tom Logan, Give us a snapshot of your life today, both personally and uh, professionally. Uh, I grew up in a, a family. My father was a pastor, Presbyterian pastor. And uh, in, uh, we, we always had all kinds of people in our home living with us, actually. In 1948, not too long after World War II, we, had, we were in Champaign, Illinois, and we had a Japanese fella man that stayed with us. And his name was Michi Akasuma, and he was actually a samurai, <laughs> and he came to live with us. And then we had uh, we had Palestinian refugees that lived in our home. We had Cuban refugees that stayed in our home. We had Hungarian refugees in our home. 
And let me just uh, <laughs> tell a quick story. <laughs> Uh, uh, my dad, you know, of course, the Presbyterians, you have sessions, and the session is the ruling body for the church and decide what you can do. My dad went in 1956. Uh, he went to the session and said that uh, he would like the church to sponsor two Hungarian refugees. And so uh, 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 the church agreed. And my dad, from we were in Decatur, Illinois, and, and my dad went from, from Decatur to Chicago 1956 to pick up the two refugees when he got there he found out that there were 60 refugees that they didn't have placed and so he rented a bus without the session approval and brought all 60 to decatur and for, for those <laughs> unfamiliar with decatur i'm a st louis guy so i know decatur well I have actually some family up there oh it's a smaller community, and in the mid '50s, it was probably even smaller. How, how large of a town is Decatur, Illinois? Now, uh, uh, how about back know. then, mid '50s? Uh, I don't know, sixty, seventy thousand, something like that. Right. So you're uh, you're changing the the, 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 the conversation <laughs> taking place in Decatur when you bring in a busload of Hungarian refugees. But it changed the it changed the town. It changed the church. It t- changed the community because they had all of a sudden sixty people. They had to have clothes. They had to have jobs. Somebody people had to take them in, and, and they lived with them. So it was it was a great great time, great church. Your dad and I, I've actually read that story about you, and it's uh, even more in depth than that. You're uh, you're giving us the cliff note version. It's an incredible story. Your dad seems like an incredible teacher. Anyway, I'm getting I'm getting off. No, that's right uh, on. But uh, uh, so we had all these different refugees that came and and lived with us, and then it, I was a very poor student. Very, very poor student. Always a, a terrible, terrible student academically. And I think my was dad, it connecting the dots, or was it just lack of interest? Uh, probably both. <laughs> probably both. But I graduated from 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 high school and got a job uh, on uh, uh, as a laborer uh, building Interstate seventy four. Saved some money up and bought a ticket to Johannesburg, South Africa. I was supposed to be a bunch of other guys go with me, but I ended up being the only one. So at eighteen years old. By myself, I fly to I fly to Ghana. All right, hitchhike around Ghana, then hitchhike around Cameroon, hitchhike around Gabon. All right, go to Lamborghini and spent two months with Albert Schweitzer. Now people don't necessarily know who he is anymore, but he was the Mother Teresa of that that age. Talk because I recognize that as part of your bio. How did you connect with Dr. Schweitzer and and? And what was that experience like for you as a young boy traveling Africa with this really great, remarkable man? Well, he had no idea I was going to be there. I just showed up. And he took me in. And his eyes, he was 80-some years old at the time, and his eyes just sparkled. And he believed in the reverence for all life. You eventually make your way home. You uh, make your way to meet the doctor, Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. You serve that organization and you serve that mission and it seems to me it's one of the turning points in your life and there's many but one is the assassination of dr martin luther king jr it seems uh this happy-go-lucky optimistic faithful cliff climber uh pivots a little bit in life after that uh i I was really kind of a shy kid and still am, I guess. But that was the working for Martin, Reverend Martin Luther King. Awesome. Unbelievable. Now, he wouldn't know me if I walked in the room. But I shook his hand twice, and I took a couple pictures of him when, and, and in Selma, Alabama, uh, after the Edmund Pettus Bridge and mm-hmm. uh, Bloody Sunday. Uh, and I went down and, and worked as a volunteer for his organization in Utah, uh, Green County, Alabama. And uh, so... We get a call. We got this demonstration in Demopolis. So we go down to Demopolis, and there's uh, maybe 500 of us, and we've got the barricade up, and there's the police with their helmets and their, 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 their guns and their batons and their shields and all that stuff standing on one side. On the other, there's 500 of us, you know, women, men, children, eight years old to maybe 80. And uh, we, we sing this freedom song. We love everybody, we love everybody, we love everybody in our hearts, oh, we love everybody now. We love everybody, we love everybody in our hearts. And then we get down, the police come up and say, you got 60 seconds to disperse or else. 
And we get down on our knees and begin to pray. Now, the Ku Klux Klan is standing behind bushes and trees with baseball bats and so forth in the yards. Uh, so we're, we're down on our knees uh, praying. And uh, they come up, uh, and uh, we are, you know, we will not be moved. We will not be moved. And they shoot off smoke bombs initially, and it goes straight up in the air. We think our prayers have been answered. And then they opened up with real tear gas. And the exact milliseconds <laughs> that that tear gas hit, we're, boom, we're up, and we're out of there running like crazy. You can't stand it. It goes through your clothes and stings your skin and burns your eyes and mouth. It just, you just can't tolerate it. I grabbed a little girl by, by the hand, maybe nine years old, to make sure that she didn't run off into the grass where the Ku Klux Klan was, headed back, and a tear gas a grenade blew up right in front of us, covered us head to toe. Next day, we go back. And we're, 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 we, we get up there and we say, we love everybody. <laughs> we love everybody. We love everybody in ours. And, and then we get down on our knees and we begin to pray. And they come up and they say, you got 60 seconds to leave or else. Mm -hmm. The police do, the state troopers. And uh, uh, then all of a sudden they say, you're all under arrest. Hey, man, we're happy. We're cheering. We're not getting beaten. We're not getting tear gas. We're going to jail. So we all line up. And we get on, uh, we get on uh, five buses. They have the school buses. They're going to take us uh, to the jail in Selma, which is about an hour away. So we're on that. We're on that on on these buses, and uh, uh, the buses are just rocking, singing freedom songs, you know. And a state trooper gets on our bus and says, "There's going to be no more singing on this bus, right? uh, 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 or I'm going to tear gas you." Well, you could have heard a pin drop on our bus all the way to Selma Jail. We get to the Selma Jail and we pull up, and every all the other buses, man, they're singing freedom songs, you know, and we're, you know, we're ashamed. So we start singing freedom songs. State trooper got on our bus and tear gassed us and blocked oh the front gosh. door, and the, that we couldn't get off. We sat in that tear gas for over an hour before we were processed, and then we were put in the cell. It was about. Uh, 150 of us, there wasn't enough room for us to sit down at the same time. There was a toilet that overflowed in the corner. There was a wash tub that had a cup on it for our drinking water for all 150 of us. We were there from Wednesday until Saturday. And then, uh, I continue on, there were six people I knew who were murdered between 1966 and 1969. And that didn't include Mark, Reverend Martin. These were people I knew. And so all of a sudden, I was changing. You know, we love everybody. We love everybody. We love everybody. You know, we just told a lie. We just told a lie. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> very angry. And that anger, the problem, it's all right to be angry, but, but the, the problem is when, when that anger turns to hate, you de dehumanize the people that you dislike, that you're angry with. So I, I go to go to Cairo, and uh, 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 go to Cairo in 1972. My wife uh, and I, and we take a job with uh, the United Front, and we're uh, uh, Governor Ogilvie is running for for re-election, and so this uh, there's all kinds of gun battles going on between the black and white communities in Cairo, and that's why I went there. I wanted to get in the battle. Uh, even though I'm a pacifist, by the way. Uh, the, the United Front hires me, and the idea is to build houses. Uh, it's a nonprofit housing development corporation, Little Egypt. And so Governor Ogilvy uh, provides the money to get us started. We got 15 houses that uh, we got financing for. We got 15 houses under construction on scattered sites, mm. nothing, nothing easy, you know. I don't know anything about construction. I don't know the difference between a footing and a foundation. <laughs> I've never, I know, I've never taken a business course. I don't know anything about business. I don't know anything about accounting. I know nothing about that stuff. All right. We ended up with a crew of 60 people, half black, half white, in Cairo, Illinois, 1972, 19, had been shooting at each other, built 150 homes in the first year and a half. Huh? On scattered sites. Huh? It was like God hit me right on top of the head. Bam. So you become what you hate. Mm. I had become what I hate. 
I'm hearing you share all this, and I'm realizing now for the first time that many of our listeners are hearing you talk about your father. They're hearing you talk about your peace marches, your singing on the buses, your handshakes with Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And they're probably thinking that my guest today is African American. <laughs> Not even recognizing that. No, you're this I'm dark haired or- Caucasian I- fella. I'm an Oreo cookie in reverse. <laughs> Tell, tell us what that means to you. I'll let you do the, um, explain it on this one. That's what I've been called by my my African American friends. But uh, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's just you know black on the inside and white on the outside. You, your passion for equality and justice, mm-hmm. in particular, is it r- racial justice? Where, where did that come from? From my dad. Yeah. And from the experiences that I had, the people that I grew up with, uh, awesome, unbelievable. Uh, uh, extraordinary people that I grew up with. Uh, the, you know, they accepted me regardless of the fact that I, I, I was uh, uh, one of the slowest ones in class. <laughs> Your wife, Jocelyn. I. You know, awesome. I, 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 I've recognized we could spend the entire hour bragging on her, but talk about Jocelyn. Uh, if it wasn't for Mama Jocelyn, I'd <laughs> either be in jail or dead. <laughs> Extraordinary woman. I have been with 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 Jocelyn since uh, 1963, and we've been married 52 years. And uh, uh, I always tell people when that know us, I say, "Oh, she's really had it easy." But uh-uh. uh, uh the, the story after story after story. <clears throat> she's the one that that uh, that will keep me in line. Mm. Uh, when uh, uh, when I was uh, in uh, Africa in 1994, uh, what had happened is I'd started a, a school in the bush and it had gone, and that's that's another story. But uh, the Reverend Timbo had had contacted me, wrote me a letter in January, said, "When you're out in in September, we want you to start a school for the hard of hearing." And I wrote Reverend Timbo back, basically just blowing him off, saying, "Well, we'll think about it." When we when we get there, you know, when it was, you know, putting him off, we get to the Embangwini Mission Station, and Reverend Tim, Timbo meets Jocelyn and I at the car, and he says, "You've got to come with us right now. This is, we got we got the Minister of Education is there, Chief Mizuka Zuka is there, we've got uh, the Senate uh, General Secretary, we've got all these important people that there, and I don't know anything about it." And I said, "Well, okay." So I go into this meeting, and I find out. That Reverend Timbo had told the government of Malawi, right, and, and this, the head of the Senate, the General Secretary, that the Marion Medical Mission had promised to build this school for the hard of hearing, and that we'd promised to come up with uh, twenty-three, twenty-four thousand dollars, and that that based on Reverend Timbo, the government had provided three teachers, and there were twenty-three students using uh, uh, borrowed buildings, mm. and I'm saying. You know, and uh, they said we need twenty thousand dollars, twenty two, twenty three thousand dollars, and the amount of money we had in the account was three thousand. So I stand up to address everybody, and my wife is there, and she's the one that keeps me in right. line. So I stand up and I say, "Well, I hate to tell you this, but we don't." And I feel this this yank on my. Co- I said, "What's up? Tell them we got the money." So I said, "We've got the money." <laughs> And we started the school. By the time we got home three weeks later, the money was in the account. Hmm? Extraordinary. So we that, that and over and over. And Jocelyn is the one that keeps us straight. We've got four programs, that, and, and there's accounting system in each one. Uh, there's never been a time, never been a time when we've ever been in a deficit uh, at the end of the year. You're sharing a little bit of her heart and where oh, this journey has led you both. But most I, most I, extraordinary woman in the world. I got to back the uh, the Toyota Land Cruiser up just a little bit farther. Yeah, well, well, in, in 1985, uh, what, what happened was I'd been in Ethiopia when I was a uh, boy, when I was 18. And in 1985, they had that big famine in Ethiopia. And so my wife and I, we gave some money to the organization that was doing such a great job of publicizing it. And we found out that 40% went for overhead. So we set up Marion Medical Mission, where the one of the founding it, 100% of what you give goes to its designated purposes. 100% of undesignated money goes to the mission field in Africa without the cost of a stamp being deducted. Now, ain't no but that's impossible. But we've been doing it since 1985. So anyway, I get uh, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Richard Morgan, 
uh, general surgeon, uh, 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 Dr. Joe Poeta, and uh, my accountant, Tom Van Horn, and a uh, businessman, Tom Kirby, and the five of us, we decide we're going to go to Africa. I mean, this is high. This is, this is tough. I mean, we're, we're awesome, right? We're going to go to Congo, uh, which is Zaire at the time, mm-hmm. and we're going to solve all the problems in three weeks. Come home. <laughs> well, it's funny. You, you keep saying uh, that was impossible, and then you talk about how you did it. Well, it seems like this is generally your mentality in life. Well, I, I, it's what drives me. I love being involved in the impossible over and over and over. I, you, can, you can take my history from, from 1972 up, to, up through today, mm. and it, over and over and over and over again, I've been involved in the impossible, and it's because only together can we be who God created us to be. Mm. If we come together, hey, hello, uh uh-uh, uh, there, there is more than enough. Just the Christians, and it doesn't have to be just, it could be anybody, you mm-hmm. know, but just the Christians could feed all the hungry people in the world. There's no reason for them to be hungry people. Just the Christians could provide safe drinking water to everybody, the world. We could do it. But we've got to come together. When, when did that calling to provide safe drinking water become yours? Uh, in 1990, <clears throat> I was uh, uh, in uh, Malawi up at uh, Mbanguini, and I went from Mbanguini and I went down to Equindeni, and I saw, uh, ran into a missionary named Dr. Uh, 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 Knowles. And Dr. Knowles took me out to, to a village, and he was very aggravated because he said, the government has promised to build. Oh, I don't want to get in trouble. But the government has promised to build a well, and they didn't do it. Over and over again, they're prom- they promise and they don't do it. Mm. And they didn't, you know, they, they, you know, and and so uh, I ended up turning to Doctor Knowles, and I said, "Well, why don't you build the well?" And Doctor Knowles turned to me and said, "Why don't you?" <laughs> now I don't know anything about engineering. I don't know anything about wells. I don't know anything. But so anyway, that's that was the beginning of, of, of the well program. And uh, we, we started building a very simple, very easy well. And the, the key to this program is you got to build a well that the extreme poor can maintain mm-hmm. if it's going to be sustainable. You're talking about people, uh, you know, that have no money. And if, and, if they, and, and if they don't grow the food, they have no food to eat. So in every interview I've ever heard you share you talk about sustainable drinking water mm. but but always the word sustainable in yeah. front of drinking water tell me what that means to you sustainable means that once the well is is, is in that marion medical mission or anybody else they don't have to go back the people mm-hmm. themselves can maintain it uh also understand you know we build a well at a price nobody else can build uh, it's just it's a fact okay uh 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 what happens is is the field officers, the African field officers, will go in and organize the villages, five men, five women. That's the village committee. And, and the village committee then has to agree to make the brick and provide the stone, sand, and the unskilled labor. The village itself has to agree to do what they can. We only do what they can't, which is what we do is we provide the pipe, the pump, the cement, and the skilled African labor, right? Even share that for a reason. Sometimes it seems like we should just supply everything, but it seems like you've intentionally chosen to supply as little as you can in order that they have to supply the rest. Why do you do that? Well, a couple of reasons. One, because then they have ownership and they have pride in, in their well. The, the, the other thing is that, is that they, you know, we, we build a well for $400. Anybody else building the same well will cost three thousand bucks. Okay, now we're able to build it for four hundred because, the, and actually, these subsistence farmers, all right, who are also uh, maintenance people, they actually make the Mark V galvanized steel pumps. We got a we got a workshop that makes the pumps in Mbanguini, Malawi, one in Zambia, and one in Mbeya, Tanzania. So then they make the pumps. What when you come into a community that does not have the wells yet? What, what explain to most of our first world listeners? You know, most of our listeners are somewhere in the United States and in about fifty-two other countries that tune in. But most of them are first world living right now. They turn on the water and mm. and fresh water comes out. When you walk into one of these villages, what is the water like? What's the situation like before your wells arrive? Well, the the they drink the water from the same place that the animals drink it. It's open holes, streams. Uh, 
sources that, that, that you and I would not not drink from, and and I won't drink from. What is the impact of that on their health? Well, it means that one in five children die before the age of five. It means that uh, uh, it means that the the family is sick. And if the family is sick, then that means they can't work in their fields. That means there's less food. If they're healthy, their children don't die. It means they can work in their field, produce more food, which means there's less starvation. Your passion for these projects and these people, what's the genesis of that? <laughs> I mean, last year, let's brag for a moment. I think you you and your folks installed 29 2,835. I round up. 10,000 <laughs> wells. No, but 2,800 yeah. wells, man. Covering 57,000 yeah. square miles right. where there are no roads in most of it. Okay? Right. There's one tarmac. <laughs> but you're, and, and, and people will go, and we're serving the rural areas, okay? And our volunteers will say, why don't they fix the roads? People don't need roads if they don't have vehicles. Right. Okay. So, and anyway, and, and, and so it's hard to get to. Now, can you imagine... You know, 2,800 uh, 2, wells, all right? That's 28,110 pound bags of cement. Now, how do you get that distributed over 57,000 square miles? It means people carrying a 110 pound bag on their head, <laughs> walking down the path, mm. putting it on a, a push bike, uh, using an ox cart or whatever. But you, you've got to get and And, and you, there's no electric power. How do you communicate? How do you communicate? How do you how do you get the villages organized? For, for we got field officers, African field officers. Each field officer covers about three thousand square miles on a motorcycle. And a field, I'm telling you the quality. These guys are awesome. All right, <laughs> a field officer's contract says he'll build a hundred wells a year. He'll be responsible for in his in the three thousand miles. Mm. You know what the average was last year? Average number of wells per field officer is 157. He gets paid for 100. All right, we got field officers that did 200 wells last year. Are responsible, like organized, it, structured. I will match these guys up with anybody anywhere. Mm. They are awesome. So I saw a picture of a man in a massive hole. Looks like it's going to be a well. <laughs> the first picture I saw of him was dirt all over his sweet bald head. And then this dude was filthy. And then the next picture is him looking up at the camera. Great. You got dirt everywhere, man. And then through all that dirt, you got these massive white teeth smiling brightly, <laughs> brilliantly toward that camera. It tells me a lot about the guy in that hole, but I think it tells me a lot about the people around him. Yeah. Talk about the joy that you see in these villages. The, the, the people in Malawi, Zambia, and Tanzania could teach us something about joy. Even though they, their children die, even though they don't have medical care, even though they don't have roads, even though they don't have enough food, they can teach. You can show up. If I could take you right now and set you down in a village, they would rush around and try to find the best chair, sit it under a tree. The little kids would come up and get down on their knees and shake your hand. They'd disappear. Even though they don't have enough food themselves, they would find a chicken somewhere and cook that chicken and, and make sure that you had something to eat before you left. Yeah. That, and, that. and they smile, they grin, they laugh. You know, uh, <laughs> there was a big famine that hit Malawi in 2015, okay? It lasted for two years. Reverend Kachi Papa, who uh, is the general secretary in central Malawi for the Presbyterian Church, uh, he was in Detroit. And uh, he was talking about the famine and the problem and so forth. So uh, I pulled him aside and took him outside. Didn't want anybody to hear what I And I told him, I said, Reverend Ketchup, Papa, I promise you that Marion Medical Mission will come up with $100,000 for you to buy maize so she can feed you. That's corn, yeah, corn, uh, uh, <coughs> to, to feed, feed, feed your people. We'll do, we'll do that. So uh, I said, don't tell anybody. We ended up buying forty-seven thousand bags. You know how much? How, forty-seven thousand times twenty dollars is what? I was told there'd be no math involved in this interview <laughs> today, and if there was math, I would be the teacher, not the student. Well, anyway, well, it, well, it really wasn't twenty dollars. It it cost us seventeen dollars and fifty-four cents per bag at the end of the day, and it's over eight hundred thousand dollars. All right. Yes. Unbelievable. Now let me tell you about the people. All right. <laughs> so Jocelyn and Doug Key and I and Mr. Kosa and Jordan Banda are at a distribution point in November of 2016, I guess it was. 
And uh, what, what had happened, what Reverend Cachy Pampa did is he went to each of his rural churches, all right? And a rural church in, in his area, he has, uh, on average, 1,000 members and 11 prayer in a rural church, okay? 1,000 members. So he went to him and he said, now, you get the Women's Guild, all right? And you get the traditional authority, which is the local chief, and you decide who the 200 families are that are in most need of food in your area. And you, you identify them. And write, write them in a list. Now, I can't guarantee you you're going to get any maize, all right? But uh, if, if I can find the maize somehow, this, at least you'll be ready, right. all right? Mm-hmm. So that's what, what happened. We were able to get that maize purchased and distributed. In our, anyway, so we're at this distribution point, and they, they unload half of it. So half of it, you know, each bag weighs 110 pounds. They got 100, they had 250 bags that time. And, and, and there were 1,800 families that showed up, and we only had bags for 250, okay? So I get up, about half of it's uh, uh, been distributed. I get up uh, and walk around the corner of the, of the church, and there on the ground are two bags of maize that they'd just been given, and the bags are open, and they're putting it into other bags and other buckets and so forth. I look across the dirt road, and they're doing the same thing over there. I look down the road, and they're doing it do it down there. I turned to Mr. Costa. I said, what in the world is going on? He said, they're sharing the maze they got with those who didn't get any. Now, can you imagine? You know, you get enough food, and right. you don't know if any more is coming to feed your family of six for a month, and you're going to share it? So I'm, I'm sitting, I said, why are these people better than me? And I began to think. I said, you know, they don't have TV. They don't have screens. Mm. They know their neighbors. Mm. Their neighbors' kids are their kids. I mean, it's like one big family. Right. And if you know somebody, you can't let them starve. That's right. So, anyway. Man, you you have been through (laughs) the height of racism here in the United States to a degree. You have been through your own accidents. You've been stuck on cliffs twice. You've been through droughts and starvation. You've been at the bottom of wells, and you, you've been at the bottom of crises in life. And yet here I am seated across from you today, and you have this simple glimmer of hope in your eyes, and you keep hitting the table with passion, man. I've never been across from a guy with more enthusiasm for life. Clearly, you haven't surrendered quite yet. What, what keeps you going when others say, uh, I, I can't be done, that the hill is too high? It's being involved in the impossible. And being involved hand in hand with with God's people, it's extraordinary. It just drives me. I can't be who I ought to be unless you are who you ought to be, and you can't be who you ought to be unless I am who I. Ought. Who said that, Reverend King? <laughs> like you brought that up, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about a few of the quotes that I've seen you or heard you or read you quote specifically from him, and I'm gonna ask you what they mean to you. Um. I believe he said this, understand the best defense against war and terror is a world (laughs) well-fed and well-read. Amen. What does that mean? Well, that means if we share what we have, there's more than enough. There's more than enough. If we reach out and grab our our, our fellow man's hand and walk with them and, and share with them, there would be no war. And there is not a shortage. How can the most powerful country and the richest country on earth say, we don't have enough? Come on. We Christians have more than enough. And God will provide it. Uh, get, get into, you know, like the feeding of the 5,000, you know? I mean, here, here, here is, here, here's, you know, the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, uh, the people are hungry. Send them home. And Jesus said, well, feed them. <laughs> Huh? And they said, well, we don't have any food, you know, if, and Walmart's closed and, and, and uh, it would take, you know, a, yeah, right. a year's salary to, to feed. Jesus says, what do you have? Oh, we got uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, well, let's share it. And they end up with 12 baskets left over. <laughs> OK, so, you know, you get you got to. You got to be willing to step out. You you, you got to use your hands and your arms and your legs and your brains and your resources. Got to use what God's given you already. And when that's done, you also have to have the courage to then take that next step. Tom, for those listening right now who either have no faith 
and that's that's many of us listening right now, or uh, have a faith that's been shattered, or they're dealing with their own own storms right now, and they're thinking to themselves, "Man, this guy, he's he's awesome, he's passionate, <laughs> he's making a difference, but he has no idea what I'm going through right now. No idea, no idea of the cliff that I'm stuck on today. And the handhold is not a jump away; it's it's a lifetime away. What what would you say to those folks that are struggling right now in their own situations? Come to Africa with me. <laughs> <laughs> Come with me. Go out into a village and see these people that have absolutely nothing and watch them smile and grin and shake your hand and go and give and share what little they have with you. Mm. Uh, and you'll be saying, ah, no thanks. No, uh uh-uh, uh. Uh-uh. They're sharing it with you. You eat it, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Anyway, when you bring a, a typical, I would imagine, American volunteer to one of the places where you serve, what is the impact in his or her life upon returning home? Because clearly we understand the impact that you are part of 2,800 plus wells and all the families that you serve through that in one year. Yeah, yeah, in one like 30, 32,000 in total. Right? Yeah, 32,000. Yeah. But talk about the impact also of those who serve well, and show up. Well, when it's the first, first time that they go uh, and they really haven't been, they're in shock. And they're probably in shock for, for a couple of weeks. There was a young man that, uh, a young man, he was in his 50s. To me, that's young. It's very young. Yeah. <laughs> Getting closer to young for me every day, man. I'm stepping toward it myself. <laughs> so the, he goes, and uh, I'm taking him back to the airport. And uh, Sean turns uh, to me, and he says, I, I asked him, I said, well, are you going to come next year? And he said, ah, no way I'd ever come here again. <laughs> There's no way. By the time he got to South Africa, he wrote me and he sent me an email. He said, well, maybe. And by the time he got home, he said, I need to go back. (laughs) And one of the problems with a new volunteer when they come, and me too, when I get back from Africa and I get back to the United States, you'd think that you'd be up. I'm depressed. I I look around. Well, number one, I'm out of the battle. You know, I mean, there, I mean, it's still in the battle here, but the mm-hmm. battle there is different. You're picking up a bag of cement, you're carrying it to a village, you're, you're, you're blessing a well, you're doing whatever. You're driving a truck through the bush. Uh, 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 but you get back here and, it's, you know, you, uh, it's, you won't believe the story that I can tell you about where I've been. And that blank stare comes back and they pat you on top of the head and say, what a good person you are. Ay, 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 uh-uh. I'm having the time of my life. I'm having the time of my life, so I recommend it. And if you haven't, if, if the other thing is, if you're having lots of problems, if you can't, if you can't pay your bills, if you're having trouble with your family, if you're having what trouble with your health, whatever it is, the solution: dig a well, <laughs> dig a well, go beyond yourself. Mm. You have a bumper sticker, I believe, or at least I've read on the back of your car. I think it says something to this. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. (laughs) True or false? Absolutely true. What does it mean? That's a lesson that that I have to learn over and over and over because I forget. But the the, the moment that you allow hate, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry, but the moment you, you step into hate, it takes over you, and you dehumanize. Mm. People become non-human. You don't care what happens to them. And that, then, is where the real problem comes in, and it consumes you. But if you can stick with love, oh, man. <laughs> Tom, as you look around, whether you're watching the uh, local media in southern Illinois or the national media out of D.C. or the international media out of London or wherever it's being broadcast from, there seems to be an awful lot of negative stories, a lot of war, a lot of famine, a lot of hatred, mm. a lot of anger, a lot of race to build higher walls and bigger bombs. This is true not only locally, but all over. And yet you are banging the table across from me today, not out of anger, but out of love and hope and faith. So I'm curious, as you look forward, what keeps you so optimistic and so passionate and so in the fight? Uh, well, it goes back to the same thing again. But, you know, uh, you, you want to see me really excited and happy? Grab me and put me in Africa driving the trucks <laughs> of the bush with Mr. Kosa. Huh? And look, look, who's nodding over here? Yep, yep, yep. 
or Mr. Mah- Mahongo or, or Jordan Banda or Reverend Masakifa or um, uh, Narenda, you, uh, Salungwe, you name them. Oh, you know, S- Salungwe, about back in 2008, I think we had that bad turn, turn, turn down in, in our economy here. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and Rick Delaney was talking to, uh, to Mr. Salungwe, our field loss rep in, uh, up in uh, 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 Karanga. And, and uh, so uh, he was saying, oh, the economy is so bad. He said, it's so bad. We got 10% unemployment. And Mr. Salungwe nodded and said, yes, 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 we have 90% unemployment here. <laughs> all things in life have an awful lot to do with perspective mm. and for the 10 percent that are out of work oof, what a burden what a cross yeah. what a pain yeah. for real yeah. i would never cheapen that but i hear you loud and clear that even on our bad days we we are so fortunate we have more than enough <laughs> <laughs> how can people learn more about your organization uh we have uh we're on facebook Marion Medical Mission uh, Facebook page, and we have a web page, which is mmmwater.org. Did I do that right, Kim? mmmwater.org, and we'll, of course, link to it on our Live Inspired podcast yeah, show notes. Yeah. But mmwater.org, and yeah. you're, I've heard you said repeatedly, but I'll, I want to make sure I'm hearing it right. For $400, mm-hmm. we can dig a well. You bet. Uh, the very first thing you said to me when I met you in the in the studio outside, I said, "Man, what what can I do? To, what, what are we trying to really convey?" And the very first thing you said to me, say it again. Come, come, go with me, join me. Anytime you want to go today, I'll show you the most incredible thing and the most incredible people, and I'll take you to well, 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 and you won't get tired. Well, so the the first thing I want to say in response to that that is I'm open to going, and I look forward to uh, joining you in Africa and hopefully bringing a couple friends. Please. The second thing I want to share is that we at Live Inspired, and this is not planned, but I want to make a donation to invest in 10 wells right awesome. now on the radio. Awesome. Awesome. So Tawanga Chomani. Say that again. Tawanga Chomani. Tell me what that means. Thank you very much. And do you pass along my love <laughs> and my respect and my honor for doing this? Uh, and uh, I want to encourage our listeners right now to visit you at your website, mmmwater.org. Hmm. Learn more. We spend an awful lot of, of our time as a society talking about what's wrong. Hmm. You spend a lot of your time talking about solutions and how to make it right. And so as a guy who believes that the, the answer to the problem in the room is in the room already, uh, man, I want to thank you for being an exhibit, an example of that to the rest of us. John, I want to thank you for giving me a chance to be here. And, and, I, and I told you when we first met that uh, your video, I played three times. <laughs> right. The first time I played it, I cried. The second time I just watched, the third time I showed it to my wife. Outstanding. We are, we are on the same page, man. Uh, well, you don't get off that easy. Praising the interviewer doesn't get you out of here early, man. You still got to walk the gauntlet. You got seven questions as we wrap up. We call them the Live Inspired Seven. And Tom, Logan, everyone who has joined us in this dance ahead of you has gone through these. So I want to make sure you do as well. The first question, and maybe Albert Schweitzer has something to say about this one, but what is the best book you've ever read? Well, obviously the Bible, and I can go back and tell you, I and mean, that's the one I, what I quote and just tell all over and over and over again. But I, I, uh, Tony Campolo has, has written several books that I've read, and, and uh, I was telling you some of the, the quotes that I like the best. One of them is, uh, what's the point of tiptoeing through life so that you arrive at death safely? <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> that's awesome we you know we, uh, 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 god uh, we, we were we were created in god's image and we reversed the favor and created god in our image <laughs> and then and then the, i like this one very much uh and and that is uh, when we die and we meet our maker i don't think that we'll be asked <laughs> to recite the books of the Bible or to explain the Holy Trinity. I think what will be asked is when my son was hungry, did you feed him? When he was thirsty, did you provide him with a, a, a glass of water? When, when he was naked, did you clothe him? When uh, he was sick, did you care for him? When he was in prison, did you visit? That's mm. what I think will be, will be asked. So anyway, that's uh, uh, Tony Compolo. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. What's one positive characteristic? One trait that you possessed as a child that you wish you possessed as strongly today gee whiz i don't know uh, 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 
what I possessed as a child. Something you displayed. You were a little one, and this was just naturally inherent within you. And then age and travel and experience and seemingly wisdom has drawn you away from what you once knew to be true as a kid. So Goodness. Break me back to that, that point in your childhood. That, that one thing you did best as a kid that you wish maybe you did a little bit better today. You know what? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stumped. I'm, I'm having trouble with that. Um, as a child, I was very shy. And uh, 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 I would say that the, one of the big things that, that I miss is the fact that we had all kinds of, of refugees that lived in our home and the opportunity we had to learn about other cultures. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, that opportunity, believe it or not, was alive in 1956. I think it's still alive in 2018. And whenever you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> They're next to us, and they're around us, and uh, they are us. So don't miss the opportunity to learn a lesson that I think uh, you are intended to learn. Tom Logan, if your house caught fire and all living things are out, people and pets, you have an opportunity now to run in and grab one item. Just one item. What would you grab? My picture albums. Yeah. (laughs) If you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach on a picture-perfect day, and have a long conversation with anybody, living or dead, who would you want to have that nice long visit with? Well, there's a number, but but Jesus. What's the first question you would ask Jesus? I said, how can I keep my anger from becoming hate? And I think at that point, Jesus would laugh and said, I've told you that. I've showed you that in 1973 and recently. All right? The answer is there. And you receive that answer, but you forget. Mm. Love. <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever received? Um, from my mom. And she said, if you want it bad enough, you can do it. And part of the reason she was telling me that was because I was not a good student. And she'd had me up against the blackboard that she had in the kitchen trying to get me to learn how to spell. Never worked. I still can't spell. (laughs) But over and over again, she would say, but if you want it bad enough, you can do it. So the point being is, no matter, no matter what, 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 uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the other people may have better skills than you. Mm. They may have, uh, 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 more talent than you, um, it doesn't matter what the experts say. Mm-hmm. Don't let them stop you. Doesn't matter what the research says. Don't let that stop you. You know, don't give up. What would you tell your 20 year old self? It's about the time you're on the cliff side. But what would you, what, what, looking back on it, what do you wish you could whisper back into that 20 year old's ear? <laughs> don't forget to love <laughs> Tom Logan it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence uh, you being a great person and you, you're too uh, humble to admit it but I will do it for you how would you like your one sentence to read he provided the boots that have the straps <laughs> you know one of the things that, that King talks about is you know People ought to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Well, they got to have boots. That's right. If they don't have boots and bootstraps, then that the whole 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 point is 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 nullified. So I would want to be known for providing the boots and the bootstraps. Well, I was I was at a conference last week, and the person who spoke directly ahead of me said, uh, "There's an old story about a guy who was walking through a village." And they noticed someone drowning in the river. And they went over to the river while everyone else was standing around watching, went into the water, pulled him out. And then another person ended up coming in down this water toward him. So he pulls him out too, as all the villagers are watching. Then a third comes toward them. And now all the villagers are coming to try to get the third guy. And then the fourth guy. And then as all these folks continue to come down toward them, the, the first guy leaves and starts walking away from the village. And one of the kings says, where are you going? We need your help. To which the traveler says, I'm going up the river. I'm going to stop whatever is causing all these people to fall in (laughs) in the first place. And man, when I think of your life, you're not just providing boots so that people can provide, uh, pull themselves up by it. You are going up the river to encourage them to stop falling in. You're part of the Mm. the solution. And it has been an honor to spend a little bit of my day with you today, Tom Logan. Mm. Thank you very much, John. I'm, I'm impressed. 
come with me. Go with me. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Then I'll just have to make sure my wife doesn't hear about the Jeep flips, the malaria <laughs> episodes, the, the, the crisis taking place on the floor. She misses that part of the podcast. I'm in good shape for joining you. Mm-hmm. But you have my commitment to uh, the financial contribution, to the prayers, to sharing the good news, and to being open to being with you in Africa in the please, near future. I look forward please, to it. Please, please. Thank you. My friends, that is Tom Logan. This is John O'Leary. Well, pull up your bootstraps, put on those boots, get after it, because today is your day, people. Live inspired. My friends, I want to take a quick moment to give you a special invitation. If you enjoy the Live Inspired podcast, what would you say to joining me live once a month? And not just joining me, but hundreds of other like-minded, Live Inspired community members. And what if you could do it from the comfort of your own home? My friends, Live Inspired in Studio with John O'Leary is exactly this, a gathering of our Live Inspired community members once a month for a live inspirational webcast. Let's do life together. Registration for in-studio only happens twice a year. And here's a secret, it's opening soon. Don't miss it. Sign up right now. Be one of the very first to know when Live Inspired in-studio registration opens. You can go right now. Check it out. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. One more time. It's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio.